Okay, so we are going to be talking about finding great places using natural light on location as you're exploring various opportunities for taking portraits. And I know that we've talked quite a bit at this point about setting up uh, studio photography. We've talked about using window light as a natural light source with a reflector or a bounce, as you can see in some of the photos that we just showed. And in this demo, I'm gonna be showing you guys some of the photos that my colleague Jordan Schulman and I took out on Northwestern's campus to show you how to find different environments that have really great lighting and uh, starting to see where light is falling um, out in the wild and how to start framing portraits that way. So um, we arrived at Northwestern and kind of took a walk around. And the first thing you always want to kind of find is where is the sun coming in? And uh, in this case, we have buildings that may or may not be illuminated, some of the landscaping, the trees in the background that are around. We have a lot of different sort of factors at play. But when we got there, the first location we found uh, was this, which is this sort of walkway next to a building. And the great thing about it is that the sun, which was, uh, this was in the afternoon, so the sun was setting uh, in the west, was shining directly on this building that you can see here on the right. And that building sort of becomes this awesome bounce that we can use as we're taking portraits here in the shade. And you can kind of see how the windows from this building reflect light that sort of uh, floods the entire uh, sidewalk here um, where I'm sort of waving my mouse. So this was our first location and we set up so that Jordan could photograph me just right here. And you can see in this picture some of the light coming through from the building that has really, that's 100% illuminated from the sun. And the great thing about places like this is that I'm not staring directly into the sun. We still have really not nice, soft, diffuse light that's coming from the building there on the other side. And um, an another sort of slightly softer bounce on this side of my face from the building, the white concrete on this side. So um, this was a really great sort of starting location and we experimented with various camera angles and positions to pose me throughout that process. Um, and it turned out really well because you know you kind of get the effect of the hair light, the diffuse light on the face, and then this really wonderful soft bokeh out background using the tel the c compression there from the telephoto lens in this case uh, Jordan's 85 millimeter Nikon lens. So that was our first um, starting place and uh, I was pretty good about setting up my own camera to take some of these shots so you can kind of see all of the different surrounding areas here. Um, so those first images were taken over here along this walkway, and then we moved over here. Now this isn't the greatest background ever, and I probably would not advise having photographed me right in front of these windows, but it was in this corridor right here that we were able to get some of these wonderful sort of more greenery in the background looking images. Okay, so again, this is just, these are just a few examples. Um, the more you're out in the wild actually trying to find some places to photograph on location, um, the better. But one thing, or a couple things you wanna look out for as far as where you position your, your subject. Um, this was maybe at 4.45 or 5 p.m. So the sun was pretty high up and pretty bright. And there were some places even, you know, where the light is bouncing off of a building. And I was still just super, super squinty, a little silly looking. It was hard to open up my eyes. Um, you want to make sure that your subject is still comfortable and isn't, you know, hardcore squinting a whole bunch. Another thing you kind of want to be on the lookout for is any background information that's uh, getting in the way of your subject or where your subject's head is. Like I don't particularly love this harsh dark line coming in from right behind my head here. Not the best. But of course the redeeming factor of this image is that we're getting some really cool dramatic light just in this environmental location, which is great. 
Um, moving forward here, uh, Jordan decided to step out and take a picture of himself on his cell phone squinting uh, in front of this building because really, truly, the, the sun was extremely bright at that time. <laughs> Don't take pictures of people when the sun is that high up right in the sun. A, creates really big shadows around the eyes, and B, it's just uncomfortable. Um, then we moved over to a shady area in the grass here, and what I want to point out about this particular scene is... Um, here we have an entire area completely in the shade and the background here where some students are hanging out, um, this whole background area is really, really bright and really illuminated. So when you're photographing a subject in the shade, you wanna make sure that the background behind them is consistent with the lighting that's on the subject instead of being 100% super, super bright. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with a little bit of that backlighting effect, which isn't exactly always what you want. Um, I think I have a couple of examples in here as well, getting through some of these ones. That was funny. Um, yeah, or maybe we didn't, oh yeah, we did. Oh yes, oh yes, here they are. So here's me, subject standing in the shade in this area where Jordan took the photo. Uh, and this whole background becomes just really, really bright, pretty distracting um, from the subject. I'm standing 100% in the shade. So it creates this kind of backlit effect. And on top of that, I don't love where the horizon line hits because it's sort of like the shadow creates the a first horizon line right here. And then there's a secondary horizon line cutting right through my head. Um, however, photographing me standing in front of the building, while it's not the most beautiful background, the whole photo is far more evenly lit. And so when we do add that vignette, slight vignette, and we do start sort of pushing where our exposure is, the subject's going to pop forward in a much nicer way. Um, oh yeah, and there's another example of me taking the establishing shot. Um, but even in this picture, you can see that I'm in the shade and then the background is just 100% lit. Totally not the best environment to take a portrait. Um, so then we moved along to an area. Um, <laughs> here's Jordan again, squinting. Uh, don't take pictures when the sun is this bright and in your face and in your eyes. Definitely a problem in the summer. Uh, we found this area uh, that was in that sunny spot in order to show you guys a few different examples of how the sun can work for you or against you. And um, while we were out here, what we did was took a few photos with me standing uh, backlit. And I know this can be like kind of cool and exciting for um, some stylized photos. I want you guys to be aware of how much information can be lost on the subject and how muddy it can get when the sun is directly behind the subject. It's a lot better even if the sun is at like a 30 degree or a 45 degree angle behind the subject because there's sort of a flattening that happens across the board. I'm not getting any definition, any sort of dynamic light on the face like I am in some of the ones over here where I am fully illuminated. It just sort of all gets washed out. And um, here's a sort of an egregiously bad example uh, where I'm standing with the sun directly behind me there's no background for context, and you can see what happens. Your light meter in the camera latches on to this brightest part of the sky, and then my portrait is um, really just dark, not illuminated. I can try to bring it up, but again, you know, it's really muddy. I have to force on a lot of contrast. It just becomes an editing nightmare. And on top of that, especially with guys who have shorter hair, girls who have shorter hair, anyone who has hair pulled back like me, um, you can always get uh, a little bit of that sun peeking through the ear like this when it's backlit. And this is like not really something that's 
advisable to try photoshopping. Just not a lot of fun. So um, here's another example. Again, kind of a cool stylized picture, but just be very aware that you're losing a lot of information here based on that sun position. One thing I like to do, especially on cloudy days, to find the direction of the light and where, where we're standing is to actually hold up my hand. And this is me explaining how to do this in person since we didn't have the video cameras rolling out on Northwestern, Northwestern's campus. I hold my hand out and I'm looking at this area um, inside of my palm. I wanna see how lit that is because to me, this area resembles or mimics pretty closely the socket where your eye sits and how much shadow is gonna fall between your eyebrow and the top of your cheekbone and then where your eye becomes recessed. So I'm looking at my hand and spinning around and yes, I do this in public and yes, I do this in front of clients sometimes in order to find exactly where the sun is, but you can see how the, the shadow becomes pretty obvious as I um, am ever so slightly turning my body. I'm just rotating around in a little circle, my whole body to find where the sun is hitting my hand. And this is giving me a really good example, just like in our demo in the garage studio where the light moves around my face. This is showing me visually how the light is gonna fall on the eye socket and um, it's great. And on cloudy days, I do this because when it's overcast, sometimes it can be really hard to find the sun or the sun's position. Uh, this is where I turned um, to the same position where you can see me standing here, uh, where everything is 100% uh, backlit. So um, avoid this. If you want to experiment with it for some stylized photos, that's fine. But just to be aware of how much detail and how difficult it's going to be to edit and to expose properly in this lighting condition. Um, so yeah, this was me <laughs> posing and then spinning around in a circle. But the light at that time was still pretty harsh. The next uh, step in our journey was to find an area over by this building, which became a really interesting space to start photographing because this area down here is all in shadow, but we had this amazing light being reflected off of the building, which sort of became this big bright bounce card. And then the sunlight coming in over the flowers um, behind me. So when we set up, uh, you can see I'm like down in this area right here in our establishing shot and the light is coming off of the concrete on this side and from behind me over here and then here it's super apparent to see how much this side of the building is acting like a big bounce card to really fill in the side of my face. And so you can see in the portraits that we took in the shoot um, we're getting that nice soft light on the front here, and then we're getting the sunlight, which was coming in on this side as a really wonderful hair light. And so what we're getting is essentially a three point lighting system that we found out in the wild, which is super cool. And sides of buildings, being in the city, um, walking around sides of houses, you're gonna start seeing where light is present and light is bouncing off of surfaces. The more you do this and the better you're gonna get at finding these wonderful, wonderfully lit on location places to take photos. It doesn't have to be on a campus like Northwestern. It can be anywhere. It can be in your own neighborhood, your own downtown, industrial area, on a farm. Um, you just have to start experimenting, taking portraits in various environments, and you'll start to really see how that light um, can change. So we did a bunch of different poses here um, in this particular lighting setup, uh, which worked really, really well. And um, yeah, no, we, we were quite excited. So I think we took quite a few portraits here um, in that setup. And then we went over to where those Black Eyed Susans were. So you can really see the, the sun as it was going lower as well, illuminating the back of my head. And I still have that soft bounce on the side of my face from the building. So I'll scoot over so you can kind of see the establishing shot here. 
um, the sun, this is all of this environment here is pretty backlit. The sun is somewhere over here, illuminating the building, illuminating the back of my head when I was standing here. And uh, then the front of me is all being illuminated again by the side of the building right here. So worked out really, really nicely. Uh, and then the last location we went was over by the lake. And you kind of have to be extra sensitive to lighting if you're working in a wide open space like a beach, a lake, a shoreline where there's not a lot of trees or shrubs growing around you and not a lot of places to find um, shade. You want to wait until literally the last half hour or 45 minutes before the sun goes down, especially in a clear day, because otherwise the sun will be super harsh and super bright. And that's where, you know, the idea of magic hour comes in. But my argument is that any good photographer can take pictures at any time of the day. Again, th these were all taken prior to true magic hour. And then we stood over here by the lake and um, when we first got there, it still was way, way too bright to even start taking a single picture and I'm like super uncomfortable squinting here. Uh, and then we waited until the light just started getting to that really nice sweet spot. So you're gonna have to wait a little bit longer um, if you're in a wide open space as far as getting a lot softer, more uh, diffuse, that golden hour kind of light. And then uh, as you saw in the technical exercise, the rule of thirds, um, figure ground kinds of light, you can see how much the image changes based on the relationship between the figure and the background here. As the lake becomes more apparent to less apparent as we look at this set of images, it dramatically changes the quality of the pictures. What's great if you are on the lake, of course, when you look out at the lake, you are facing east. And so you always have a sunset at the west, which makes for a really wonderfully illuminated um, photograph. At that point, I was just like, oh man, it is so bright. Uh, you have a really nicely illuminated photograph or subject because the sun is all the way over here. Now, as the sun continued to go down, we get to this, you know, our color balance, our color temperature even changed because the sun kept going down. It may have even gone behind a building at this point. We have this really nice, soft light. It looks like a cloudy day. It's completely changed, even though it's just how, how the lighting position changed as the sun went down, which is pretty amazing. Um, it's a lot of pictures of me in a very cool uh, moo moo dress, but we wanted to make sure that we got all of the right pictures to show you guys examples of what this looks like and, oh, that's the great face right there, um, <laughs> and what you can do in your process of finding great spots out in the wild and starting to understand lighting position, where light is bouncing, um, and really taking advantage of that as you venture out on portrait shoots on location um, with your subject, with your friends, with your family. I highly, highly recommend doing it. And that wraps up our set of videos covering portrait lighting and uh, lighting position. And I hope to see so many of these uh, different factors all come into play in your uh, upcoming projects.